Hey, today I want to talk with you about the uh, launch leadership competency of persevering. How do you push through and uh, make it through so that you can lead at the next level? And, uh, you know, the word says to us, it says, hey, don't grow weary in doing well, because in due season you'll reap a harvest if you just don't quit. And uh, that may be a little bit of a paraphrase from my own version. But the understanding that I have is that God says, hey, look, work, go to work, stay at it, labor at it. And don't quit. You never know when you're just a, a, a one more day or one more movement away from really seeing God do big things. And so we're going to talk today just about how do you persevere, particularly when two things are working against you. And there's a lot that works against you as a church planter. There's a lot that is uh, apt to make you want to quit. But I think there are at least two things that I think really undermine our staying power over the long haul. One is criticism. Hey, look, if you're a leader, just get ready. You are going to be criticized. Now, I know they all say they love you when you get started, but you just lead long enough. People are going to decide that they're not really sure if they like you anymore or not. You're going to make decisions that are going to bring people discontent, or you're going to move folks beyond their comfort zone, and uh, that's going to bring criticism your way. I think about Moses as probably one of the quintessential leaders in the, all, in, in the whole Bible, and yet Moses is constantly being criticized by people as he tried to lead them. And at any moment, Moses could have rightfully just said, I'm out, I quit. Because people complained constantly. They complained about the food. They complained about where they were. They complained about the dangers. They complained that Moses thought he was the only one who could lead. They were just complaint after complaint after complaint. And as a leader, you're going to face that. You're going to hear criticisms about you. And what I've found as a leader personally is that I can have a hundred positive affirmations. People can send me a hundred positive emails telling me I'm the man and I like it. But if I get one negative email, it'll send me into a tailspin for two weeks. And I'll forget about a hundred positive uh, affirmations. And so as a leader, as a young emerging leader, you're going to have to learn to deal with criticism if you're going to stay. So how do you deal with criticism? Well, I want to give you four things to think about as you consider uh, criticism. First of all, is it even true? Uh, most criticism is not true. And if you know it's not true, then discard it. They didn't have enough information or they didn't understand or whatever. If it's not true, as hard as it is, you've got to just throw it out and say, this person's crazy. The other side of that is it may be true, and this is where your self-awareness has to come into play. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We all lead from strengths. We have weaknesses. We have places where God gives us clear vision, but we also have blind spots. And so if you hear criticism and you ask yourself, is this true, and you find that it is true, then you have to deal with that. And so that may mean that there's an adjustment that needs to be made. It may be that there's something that, that an apology has to be made or whatever. But, but don't uh, dismiss it just because you're the leader and you can't stand to have criticism. You've got to be self-aware enough to know that you're not perfect. You may have missed it. And so you've got to deal with that criticism. Secondly, I would say pray. Um, we want to deal with everything. We want to handle everything. And yet Moses taught us to pray. He prayed for those people who criticized him. He prayed and asked God for direction. He said, God, you lead. If you don't go, we don't go. If you go, I want to go. He asked God to be gracious even to his worst critics. And so for, uh, for us, at times we need to pray. I think about David who was being criticized and in uh, the book of Samuel, I think that the people even wanted to kill him because um, he had been off on a raid, and they had been off on a raid, and while they were gone, the enemy came in and, and sacked their camp and took their wives and their children. And the Bible says David had to strengthen himself in the Lord. And if you're going to persevere, you're going to have to learn to strengthen yourself in the Lord, and that comes through prayer and conversation with God and feeding on the Word. And so uh, talk to God about, about the hurt and talk to God about the person who is hurting you, but learn to pray. Then thirdly, I would say you have to have uh, this idea of perseverance. You've got to have some, some stickability and some resolve if you're going to make it. Um, if you're going to lead and lead well, I think you've got to make a resolve in your heart to stay for a long, long time. The average tenure of a pastor, typically speaking, average tenure, depending on your denominational background and affiliation, just done the, the research that I've done, Somewhere it's between two and seven years, okay? 
Um, if you're of a Baptist persuasion, it's on the lower end of that. If you're non-denominational, it, it seems to go to the to the other end of that a little bit. But for the most part, it's between two and seven years. Okay, and you may think that's a long time, but every year, um, Leadership Magazine comes out with a list of the fastest growing and largest churches in America, and they list the pastor, and then they list the tenure of the pastor of the fastest growing and largest congregations. Now, if you had to guess, what do you think is the average tenure of the pastor at the largest congregations in America? Well, if you guessed and said, well, I think probably the the tenure for the largest churches is seven years, 10 years, 15 years, you still wouldn't be there. The average tenure for the largest churches in America is 18 years. What about for the fastest growing churches? Because our tendency is to think those are young guys who are moving quick and doing this. What do you think is the average tenure of the pastor at the fastest growing churches in America is? Three years. There are some people who have meteoric rises. Five years. Ten years. It's 14 years. So it takes... 14 to 18 years to have a fast-growing and large church. Now, you think about that. Most of us are turning over after seven years. Why? Because it gets too hard. I don't want to do it anymore. People are too too rough on me. Or, look, there's a greener grass on the other side. I want to go to another place. And statistically, the, the facts are that you're not ever going to lead a significant move, movement of God unless you persevere. If you have some resolve to stay through good times and through bad times. And then fourthly, I would say you got to have responsibility and take responsibility um, for yourself personally, but also for the ministry. The, the scripture tells us in number 17 that uh, Moses was being criticized uh, by some of the, the people in, in Israel because uh, he thought he, they thought that, hey, who told you, Moses, you're the only one who can lead? Who told you and Aaron that y'all have to be the only ones that God can hear from? And so I don't know if you remember this story, but uh, God told Moses and Aaron to get a rod from each of the 12 tribes. They would bring them in before the Ark of the Covenant, lay them out, and in the morning God would let them know uh, whom he had chosen. And in the morning they came in and it was Aaron's rod that had budded. And that was God's way of saying, I've chosen Aaron. He didn't pick this. They're not limiting anything. This is a decision from God. And so God picks some people to lead. Now, let me tell you why that story matters to me. I've got some very dear friends who in the last six months became extremely critical of me. They became critical of our church leadership. They began to say things like, man, all you guys do is, uh, you know, y'all look around and see what else is going on and try to emulate that or what makes you guys think you're the only ones that can lead or God can speak through you. Um, th- there were a lot of criticisms that were leveled that were harsh. And because these people were my friends, it was very difficult to deal with. But in my reading, I came across number 17, just in my general reading. And I came across this story where God said, listen, I picked you to lead. I've chosen you. I've called you out. And so what I had to do was I had to come to a place where I'm okay with saying to my friends, hey, I appreciate that you know more about how to lead this church than I do. But the fact is, God's going to hold me accountable for it, and so I'm going to take responsibility for that. And so as I'm criticized, at times I have to remember that I'm the one who's going to stand before God and give an answer for where I'm at and how we have led um, in in the church. So I've got to have that responsibility. So you're going to be criticized, and you've got to learn to handle that if you're going to persevere. Secondly, I would say criticism, second part is soul care. You've got to learn to take care of yourself. We give and we give and we give and we give and we go and we go and we go. And what happens is we wind up burning ourselves up, burning ourselves out, or getting to a point of fatigue and and just being tired where we don't have um, spiritual sense or strength to resist and we wind up doing something stupid. And a guy who's really helped me in this particular area uh, of life and ministry is a guy named Wayne Cordero. He's written a book called Leading on Empty, and uh, I would highly recommend it to you. Part of what I'm about to share with you probably is covered in that book. But Wayne taught us in a a, um, seminar, he said, listen, you've got to care for your soul. You've got to care for who you are. 
And uh, for many of us, we have the sense that somehow or another, we can just constantly go without having margin. And he said, listen, every page of a book has margin. Every piece of paper you write on has margin. Even a plate has margin. And that's to keep you from spilling over. And he said, life and ministry are done in the margin. And so you've got to create some down space in your schedule and create some white space where you're not constantly going. Another way of thinking of it is a, a fulcrum. And uh, the, the challenge is always for balance. Hey, I need to balance work and play. And he said, that's a, that's a lie. That's a fallacy. As a leader, you're never going to find balance. He suggested instead finding rhythm. That there are seasons when you're going to work extremely hard and you're not going to have much time personally or with your family. But in another season, there ought to be times whenever you invest in yourself personally and in your family and you don't work nearly as much or nearly as hard. And you don't apologize for that. For us, our rhythm at our church is January, February, a hard push. Then there's a pullback and there's time for personal stuff and family stuff. Easter is a hard push. And then there's time for personal stuff and family stuff. Not that you don't do those things at all in those push times, but you just learn the rhythms of the calendar. August, September, hard push, and then marked by a following of a time of personal time or, or just not so much grind. You've got to find your rhythm as a leader if you're going to persevere. And then he drew for us a barrel, and uh, this barrel was kind of like a gauge of, of your tank, your ministry tank, being full or not full. And at the bottom, he drew this big, huge, gaping hole, and he, 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 he said, these are things that drain you. And he had us list out, what are the things that drain me? And I, that would be one of the things I would say to you. What are the things that drain you? And you ought to make a list. Hey, whenever I'm doing this, it drains me. The things that drain me are budgeting, um, counseling. Um, whenever there's a, an extended time of, of planning or, or things like that, those things just drain me. And so I've got to know that when those things are a part of my life, they take a lot of energy. Then he asked us, he wrote at the top of the barrel, he, he drew a, an intake valve. And, and he said, what are the things that fill you? What are the things that give you life? And for me, that's time with my wife. I enjoy running and, and doing triathlon. I enjoy hunting. Uh, things like that that just add life to me. Um, and so then he said, listen, the, it, the tendency for most of us is whenever the outtake valve is wide open and you're doing a lot of outtake, the tendency is to shut off the intake valve because you don't have time. You don't have time to go on a date. You don't have time to go to the movie. You don't have time to, to go run or whatever. And he said, what happens is whenever you, all you have is outtake and no intake, your gauge starts going down and you get irritable, you start getting angry, you start making poor decisions, you start reaching a point of vulnerability to sin and temptation, burnout and crash and burn. And so he said it's foolish. He said spiritual suicide, ministry suicide is to cut off the intakes to concentrate on the outtakes. So here's what he said do. He said the larger the outtake, the larger the intake needs to be. The harder you work, the harder you have to play. And again, part of this is that sense of, of timing, and, and it's a part of your rhythm. But when you see that you have a season that is coming up that is going to be labor-intensive, either on the front side or the back side, you need to play hard and get filled so that you have something to give. And so just as a ministry leader, if you're going to persevere, you've got to get your mind around this idea of soul care, of caring for your spirit, creating margin in your schedule, Getting an understanding that I'll never balance. 12 months out of the year, be balanced. That's a fallacy. I've got to work in rhythm. And then understanding that principally as you give a lot, you've got to have a great intake. So that's my encouragement for you guys as you walk through your training, the launch of your church, and, and then into uh, just days of, of great victories, but also difficulty that may lay ahead, is that you persevere that you learn to handle criticism without allowing that to wreck your world or ruin your day, that you have a sense of what is legitimate and you learn and grow from that and what is not you just discard, that you learn to pray, that you develop a steely resolve to hang in knowing that it takes a while for you to establish just your credibility and ability to lead well in your, in your church and that you truly would step in as a calling from God to your calling and to, and to walk in obedience to that even when it's hard. And secondly, that you would care for your soul. 
that you would find places of margin, that you would learn your rhythms, and that you would care for your heart and not just give until you're depleted, but that along the way you would care for your soul through spiritual intake, through just enjoyment of life, and through caring for your family and your deepest relationships. I pray that you would indeed not grow weary in doing well, because in due season you will reap a harvest if you just don't quit.